Well, good morning. See, that was even better than what you usually get, okay? I'm doing better already. Yeah, so about a month ago, he asked if he, I could preach one of this series with him on the three temptations of Jesus. Although, the first thing I thought when he asked him, he sounded kind of like my dad. He asked you to do something, but you know it's not a question. You're going to end up doing it, whether you like it or not. I did kind of want to anyways. I have spoken in a service before, though. It was during a service the youth put on during our missions trip up in Turner Lake last year. This is going to be a lot different, though, I realized, last week, because I know all of you. (laughs) And a lot of you have been here for my whole life and have taught me a lot, so this is going to be weird that I'm supposed to teach you something. It seems really different because I have next to no life experience in comparison to some of you, yet I'm supposed to be teaching you. But I've been praying that God will show me something that will teach you guys something in this lesson. So today I'll be finishing the series on the temptation of Jesus. past two weeks, Ryan has looked at the first two temptations. The first was he turned the temptation to turn stone into bread, and the second was to worship Satan as a shortcut to the power he would receive after the cross. The third is when Satan tempted Jesus to jump off the highest point of the temple in Jerusalem. So in Luke 4, 9... It says, the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you are the son of God, jump off. When I first read that, I was not sure how that was a temptation at all. Was it a temptation to prove Satan wrong, to just shut him up after the three temptations already, and he was starting to get annoying, or just wanted to jump off for fun, which didn't really make sense at all either. What I found was it would be more of a temptation for Jesus to test God. It's not that he shouldn't be performing miracles or anything, because he does that all the time, and it's great. But it had more to do with the motive. Obviously, if Satan tells you it, it's a bad idea. But I I compared it more to a child testing their parents. Every day they push just a little bit farther, do it really slowly, and eventually they get away with a whole lot more mischief than they ever should. I believe this is why testing God like that can become a sin. God knows what your true motives are, and he's probably the best at disciplining his children, too. The way God most often speaks to me is through music. He speaks through lyrics or just from an emotion from a particular piece. While putting putting this sermon together, a new song lyric popped into my head. This time it was a new album by Flyleaf that my dad just got. The song starts, how can you act like you know when all you know is to lie? That pretty much summed up my first reaction to Jesus' temptations. How could anything Satan had to say be good at all? So obviously listening to the devil is a bad thing. But it was the putting himself in danger so God could save him, which was the pointless part. If anyone has seen the movie The Pursuit of Happiness... Will Smith's character's son tells him a story about a man during a flood. In this story, the man is sitting on the top of his house during a flood, the water slowly rising. But he says, no, no, God will save me. I don't have to be worried about anything. And then a boat comes along. Here, jump in. We'll save you. He's like, no, thank you. God will save me. A second boat comes along. Same thing. No, thank you. God will save me. Third boat comes along. No, thank you. God will save me. Flood rises and he dies. (laughs) He gets to heaven and asks God, Why didn't you save me, God? God replies, I sent you three big boats, you dummy. (laughs) I thought that was pretty cool. This guy wasn't exactly putting himself in danger, but keeping himself there for no reason is pretty close. Personally, I always thought it would be pretty cool to save someone's life, being a lifeguard and all. But I soon noticed that wishing to be able to save a life, I was wishing for someone's life to be in danger kind of stopped hoping for that one to happen. Some seem to believe Christianity makes you invincible, though, and this is a problem. And when good Christian people pass away, some people start to get bitter with God. We only like to accept what seems reasonable to us. That's one of the problems with us. 
When something bad happens to a good person, everyone thinks there's something terribly wrong with the world. I guess you could say that we all just believe in karma. And this is kind of like the story of Job. Job is one of my favorite books. It's the story of the most righteous man in the land. He was extremely wealthy and had the most beautiful family. And Satan told, Satan told God Job would turn away from God if bad things happened to him, since he'd been blessed so much. So God took everything away from Job at once. But, God, oh, but Job never turned away from God. So God gave him back even more than he ever had. All Job asked for was an ex- explanation, which I'm sure anyone in his position would. If Jesus need, needed a test or an explanation from God to know he was there, did he really have faith in God? I think that's the big question here. It's, do we have the faith in God that he will always do what's best for us? A faith like Job? So Jesus knew that putting himself in danger and listening to Satan to test God were both pretty bad ideas. There is a big reason why the third temptation is a bit different from the others, though. After each temptation, Jesus quotes scripture to show why what Satan is showing is wrong. But during the third temptation, Satan quotes scripture to encourage Jesus to do wrong. Interesting reversal there. So, if we continue on in Luke 4, 9. So it said, Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Obviously, there's a significance of the devil quoting God's word. It shows how easily even the best things can be taken out of context and used for the exact wrong reason. But there is something else strange I noticed when I was looking over it with Ryan. My Bible has the references for all the scripture quotes during the chapter, and I noticed all of the quotes from Jesus came from Deuteronomy. So the great history and commandments of God's people in the wilderness. But the reference to the devil's quote led to somewhere else, to Psalms 91 the book of songs for, of worship written by King David. So like I said, I always feel closest to God whenever I'm doing something musical. I like to just sing and play my guitar the best. but Or sometimes just listening to my favorite music works too. That was one reason I really loved going to Turner Lake, because I got to play music a lot. I led the worship team up there too, so that caused more stress than anything, but it was fun. It was the act of God in itself that my fingers weren't bleeding from my guitar strings every day. But I spent so much time just playing music and listening to God there, and I felt so close to God because of that. It was great. Now I try to make a habit of playing some guitar to get my head in the right place before I study my Bible or something. But with the devil quoting a worship song, this shows just how easily worship can actually become a serious distraction. Not that worship is a bad thing. Obviously, it's a really good thing. But a lot in church worship services, I'll catch myself focusing just on the sound rather than actually praising God. Or just singing because that's what everyone else is doing. When you're in a worship service or in any other form of worship, be sure of what you're doing. We need to be sure our hearts are in the right place when we go to God. In James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. If we come to God in worship and put in an effort to draw near to God, he will draw closer to us as well. It will always be perfectly clear to us that God is with us, and it becomes a cycle. Us and God constantly growing closer to each other. No one will ever even need to think of testing God to prove he's still there, because we'll know that. We will all be so close to God, even the idea of doing that would seem like such a useless endeavor. So, I guess the big moral of the story here is we need to draw near to God, and he will draw near to us.